that is extremely personal to me as a parent, as well as as an active member of, this, of all the various groups on social media. Um, the incidence of hydrocephalus is relatively high after hemispherectomy. We have prepared an infographic for you, which was included in your materials, um, which is what we're going to start doing with every large published study post hemispherectomy. So I've asked Dr. Handler to talk about uh, this issue. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Um, it's important not to take things too, too, too seriously, however. This is a lead-in to my next slide, which is actually what is inside of a head. Because in order to understand what, in, in order to make sense of how hydrocephalus becomes a problem, you really have to think about it this way. So we have a skull, which is a fixed volume, inside of which you have a brain, you have blood and blood vessels, and you have fluid, or cerebral spinal fluid. Where does cerebral spinal fluid come from? Cerebral spinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexus, which is an organ that sits within the ventricular system, within the ventricles of the brain. This is a diagram of the shape of the ventricular system, and you can see it's a little bit complex, and you can see that there are the lateral ventricles, which communicate to the third ventricle, communicates to the fourth ventricle, and fluid then um, is emitted from the brain into the space around the brain. This is a depiction, this is a cartoon that shows the relationship of the ventricular system to the rest of the brain. And you see it's deep in the center. Um, and that has consequences because the ventricular system sits between the brain and the skull on the outside. So things that change the volume of the ventricular system can have the effect of compressing the brain, and that's where the problem arises, okay? <coughs> this is another depiction, a little bit more complicated, that shows the relationship of the choroid plexus to the ventricles. Now, this is a, a, this is a slice from the top, and you can see the ventricles here, and you can see this pink thing that has a pin in it, which is the choroid plexus which is, again, the organ that makes spinal fluid, produces it, and deposits that fluid into the ventricular system. Now, again, CSF circulates throughout the ventricular system and then out of the ventricles into the, what we call the subarachnoid space. That's the space around the outside of the brain, between the brain, the coverings of the brain, and the skull. And again, it starts in the lateral ventricles. It travels through the foramen of Monroe, which is a hole between the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. It travels through the aqueduct of Sylvius, which goes to the fourth ventricle. And then it comes out through foramen of those are holes into the subarachnoid space where the fluid circulates and then gets absorbed into the, what we call the arachnoid granulations. And this is a cartoon that shows how the fluid comes out of the fourth ventricle here, circulates around the spinal cord, through the basal cistern, up over the surface of the brain, and then gets absorbed into the blood up at the top in what, what are called arachnoid granulations. Now, recall that um, this is all happening in a, an enclosed box, which is the skull. Um, what we have with hydrocephalus is a disturbance of the normal flow of circulation through this whole system. And what happens is when you get a disturbance of that circulation, you get an obstruction, and that raises pressure. Now, usually that is associated with an increase of the size of the ventricles. Again, the ventricles sit between, uh, the, the brain sits between the ventricles and the skull, so the brain gets squeezed when that occurs. Um, usually you have increased pressure within the ventricles, but on the other hand, it's not necessarily an all-or-nothing phenomenon, and it may take a while to become evident. Now, recall that, in, that so hydrocephalus is, is a very common condition, particularly in small children. Now, remember I've said that it happens that the fluid pressure goes up inside the brain, well, in small babies, remember, the skull is not firm and fixed. The babies have 
bones that float on the surface. And so what happens with small babies is that the, the skull itself expands, as you can see in this picture here. You can see how much, how, how dramatically large is this baby's head with hydrocephalus shortly after birth. Now, in older kids in whom the skull has fused, you don't have the opportunity to expand the head to compensate for that increased pressure. So what happens is kids become symptomatic from that increased pressure. And that, again, is because you don't have the opportunity to expand the skull. And so what happens is kids develop headaches, nausea or vomiting. Papilledema is a term that describes changes in the back of the eye that uh, a physician or anybody who has the equipment to look into the back of the eye can see. And it causes changes in the back of the globe that are obvious to an examiner that is a sign that pressure is elevated. Oculomotor signs, sometimes kids who have elevated intracranial pressure will not have their eyes move in what we call a conjugate fashion. Instead of, instead of having the eyes move together, the eyes diverge, and that may be a sign of elevated intracranial pressure. And then eventually kids can become lethargic um, or even comatose from, um, from hydrocephalus. And so it, be, it can become a life-threatening uh, condition. Sometimes, however, it's not life-threatening, but you do see more subtle chronic changes in kids with hydrocephalus. You can see episodic headaches that become progressively worse. Kids can have morning vomiting, and eventually kids who are in school can have loss of, of uh, intellectual milestones. Uh, and so there are a variety of different ways that hydrocephalus can, uh, can show itself. Now, how do we assess hydrocephalus? As most of you, I'm sure almost all of you know, you do imaging of the brain uh, in the course of workup of kids with neurologic conditions. And what we can see on, uh, so CT is the, uh, historically was the most easily accessible and first uh, way to image the brain. And um, that's quick, it's very, it's very common, all emergency rooms have them. The problem is it uses radiation, and so we're moving now to try to use MRIs, which are getting more and more efficient. Uh, once upon a time, you had to be sedated in order to get an MRI. Now, at least for the purposes of assessing for hydrocephalus, you can get a quick MR in a minute or two, and the child does not have to be sedated, and so we're more and more going in that direction. Um, one can see changes in the ventricles on these imaging techniques. Now this is an example of a normal, uh, this is a normal CT, or a CT of a normal brain, and what we can see is in this set of images, white is bone, um, gray is the brain, it's okay, this is okay. Is this, is it, oh, it's not, it's not projecting, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, all right, so what we can see on this is that the, the brain, the skull is white on a CT scan, the brain is gray and it's got different uh, densities of gray and in the center you can see these dark areas which are the ventricles, okay? Now, in hydrocephalus it's pretty clear that the ventricles have dramatically expanded and you can see that the, the gray has less differentiation and there's a little cap of black on the ventricles there that's periventricular edema a fluid that leaks out from the ventricle into the brain related to that high pressure now hydrocephalus can have a variety of different causes it can be congenital meaning it's something you're born with like that baby whose picture I showed you before or it can be related to the occurrence of a tumor it can be caused by blood vessel problems um, it can be caused by inflammation, and after hemispherectomy, the most likely explanation for hydrocephalus occurring is inflammation probably related to blood that gets deposited around the ventricular system and around the brain in the course of doing such an operation. Not that it's a sloppy operation, but that's what happens. Now, there are a variety of ways to treat elevated intracranial pressure related to hydrocephalus. Sometimes, if you think it's temporary, 
and you may get away with it without a permanent system, you can use uh, a variety of techniques that we refer to as CSF diversion. And you can use a temporary drain that goes out. Many of some families have been through this, uh, probably all of you actually, and you may have had the circumstance of an external ventricular drain for a period of time to see if hydrocephalus develops or whether it's necessary to put in a permanent system. Often, CSF diversion is temporary, particularly postoperatively, particularly in the context of bleeding or even of infection. Of course, when it's not a temporary situation, but hydrocephalus is obviously going to be long-standing, we put in a shunt, which, which will drain excess CSF from the brain to another place in the body where it will then get absorbed into the bloodstream. The shunt is a silicon, what we call a silicon elastomer. It's a, it's a, call it a plastic or rubber, but it's made of silicon. It's a fairly sophisticated technology. Uh, travels through a subcutaneous pathway and gets delivered to a variety of different terminal sites. And these are images of, of two different companies. No. We, the shunt has several uh, components. Uh, the ventricular catheter, which goes from the, the space under the skin through the brain into the ventricle, a reservoir and a valve, which may have a fixed pressure or a variable pressure, depending on the preference of the surgeon, and then a distal tubing that delivers that fluid to someplace else in the body. And all of the shunt systems function on the basis of the differential in pressure. Pressure goes up in the brain, causes a valve to open, which allows fluid to pass through the system until the pressure drops down low enough that the valve shuts off. This is the picture of, the, of a shunt system. So there's the ventricular catheter that goes, the skull would sit right up here, the ventricular catheter will go down into the ventricle. This is a valve, this is a fixed pressure valve that then connects to a distal tubing, and the distal tubing runs under the skin and then dumps to someplace else in the body. This is a picture of a, an adjustable pressure valve. This is the pressure adjustment mechanism. This has a fixed pressure. It comes from the manufacturer. The valve will open and close at a fixed pressure. Here, you can apply a magnet externally and change the pressure at which the valve will open up and allow fluid to flow. Um, unfortunately, the ideal ventricular shunt would have no complications, no malfunctions, would maintain normal intracranial pressure, would drain the appropriate amount of spinal fluid at a particular instant. That means that the rate would have to vary according to the rate of production of CSF, which we know, in fact, does vary over the course of the day. Unfortunately, there is no such valve yet. People keep working on it. So we're kind of stuck with where we are. Where does the shunt dump into? The most common place that we drain fluid with a shunt is into the abdomen, the peritoneal cavity, which has a very large surface area that will allow fluid to be absorbed. There's always a certain amount of fluid that's in the peritoneal cavity because that, that space is where the internal organs sit. The, the, we call them the viscera, stomach, intestines, liver, and that's a, that's a space that everything moves around in there. You probably are getting hungry and you can feel everything moving around in there. Um, and, and the way those surfaces move one against the other is with a, a little film of fluid. And so what we, can, what we end up doing with a shunt is putting additional fluid that just circulates along with the normal, um, along the normal pathways that already exist there. Um, the, one of the advantages of using the peritoneal cavity is that even in a very small child, you can put in a very large length of tubing that can expand as a child grows. Whereas some of the other places that we will put a shunt, there's less opportunity for growth. The two most common other places that we'll put a shunt are into the pleural space, which is between the chest wall and the lung. But again, that's smaller than the abdomen. 
And it has a potential problem that if there, if there were to be a problem and fluid not get absorbed properly, it would put pressure on the lungs and would compromise breathing, which then makes for other trouble. Sometimes we put it into the heart. Uh, that's the least advantageous because there the child grows, the catheter comes out, it's no longer in a good location, and it may malfunction. This is just a depiction of the fact that shunts actually do work. You can see the very large ventricles in a, in a patient with hydrocephalus, and this is the same, uh, this is a set of CT images now that the shunt is in place. The shunt shows up as the white line that you see there sitting in the ventricular system. So shunts do work. Um, there are a variety of different complications that can occur when we place a shunt. I'm going to try and move along here. Uh, it's rare to have hemorrhages. It's rare to have seizures provoked by the placement of a shunt. But the bigger issue is that shunts can malfunction. Um, it, the malfunction can occur either because the catheter uh, that's in the ventricle gets material deposited in it, um, or because the valve itself malfunctions, or because you have a, a break in the distal system, a problem with the distal uh, system. The most common, in this day and age, the most common way that shunts malfunction is the catheter that's in the ventricle gets occluded. And under those circumstances, we do have to intervene because when the catheter, when the shunt no longer works, pressure goes up, kids become symptomatic. And again, this is a picture of someone with a, the ventricular system in the course of a normal shunt function, and you can see here that the ventricles do blow up when the shunt malfunctions, and it can be fairly subtle on the imaging, and something that uh, we neurosurgeons have to be sensitive, and you parents need to be sensitive to. And I would say this, it's important always to know what a baseline scan looks like. Okay, we will always tell our families to make sure we have a good scan obtained when a child is completely asymptomatic so that if you develop signs and symptoms that may suggest a shunt malfunction, you can get imaging and see, uh, you can see a picture which shows that the ventricles are bigger than they used to be even if the ventricles are not huge as I showed you before. This is enough that somebody becomes symptomatic. Uh, shunt infection is a major problem with shunts. It occurs in some 5%. Actually, in our institution, it's about 2%, but in nationally, it, it is as high as 8 or 10%. Um, and again, it may cause the shunt to malfunction. It causes kids to become symptomatic and something that we all have to be alert to because it's a foreign material that's implanted into the brain. Uh, Patients are at risk to infection when a shunt is planted. So what about hydrocephalus after hemispherectomy, which is, of course, why we're talking about any of this? Um, there have been a few articles that have recently summarized what we know about hemispherectomies and, uh, and shunts, and it turns out that the cause of, uh, of the epilepsy becomes important in predicting whether you're going to need a shunt or not after your hemispherectomy. Um, so there are higher shunt rates reported with hemimegalencephaly, which is the condition of overgrowth of half of the brain. Uh, the brain, I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, but it, the brain gets very, it, 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 it's, a, it's a developmental abnormality that has occurred. These kids are particularly prone to develop, um, to develop hydrocephalus with 40% of those kids in one series requiring a shunt infection in one series 100% of kids who had a hemispherectomy after infection required a shunt. Lower rates with focal cortical dysplasia, a more limited area of abnormal uh, brain development, um, or an even lower rate with Rasmussen's encephalitis. Another series, this is one that uh, our institution participated in, hold a group of 15 epilepsy centers and the neurosurgeons there compiled uh, data on 690 patients who'd had either functional hemispherectomy or, hemis or anatomic hemispherectomies. And in this series, 23% developed hydrocephalus, 
uh, the observation being that it was much more common after anatomic, anatomic hemispherectomy than after functional hemispherectomy. Another recent publication from 2015 looked at 29 articles reviewing all comers with hydrocephalus, with uh, hemispherectomies, and they were able to assemble data on, uh, on 1,161 pediatric patients. And in this particular series, they reported an overall rate of 14% of kids with um, hemispherectomies or functional hemispherectomies requiring shunts. And I'm way over time. This is just a couple of images uh, showing a, hemis a functional hemispherectomy. You can see the cut there, the cut there. And this is preoperatively. You can see that this patient had had a large stroke. You can see the ventricles are relatively normal in size, and after the hemispherectomy, the ventricles remain normal in size. By contrast, this is a child with hemimegalencephaly. You can see that this half of the, of the brain is much larger than the normal other side. This child went on to have a functional hemispherectomy, and one can see, let me just go back for a second. So, we always talk about midline structures, and you'll see that the, this has a little bit of an arch towards the affected side here. You see that? Somebody say yes, we see it. Thank you. <laughs> and, and so by contrast, now the ventricles are relatively small. Now after the hemispherectomy, you had this huge dilation of this area, and you can see how instead of the midline structures being pushed th towards that side, everything is shoved over here. Not only that, this ventricle is much larger than it had been preoperatively. She had a shunt place. There's the little white, um, this is the tubing. You can see the ventricles are already much smaller. This is the next day. The ventricles are already much smaller. And then subsequently, like several months later, you can see the ventricles are quite small and it, things are shifted back towards this side. So again, shunts do work. Hope I haven't put you to sleep. <laughs> and I'll be glad to take any questions if we have time. <laughs> All questions to the end. Thank you. While we're switching speakers, one of our sponsors is a company called NextGenic. They make a free app called Image Inbox. Image Inbox, please write it down. I have it on my phone if anyone wants to see it. All of my son's scans are on here. So if we're on vacation and suddenly the shunt is failing, all we have to do is email our regular neurosurgeon with the new scan information. And then, no, excuse me, all we have to do is show the current facility that's imaging him the scans off the app so that they can see what his baseline scan is like and compare. We can talk about this afterwards. It's free, image inbox.